Hello everyone. Today we're continuing our deep dive of Richard Dawkins and Yan Wong's book, The Ancestor's Tale. In this episode, we're going to discuss the diversity of Rafe and Fish. So let's jump right in. <laughs> Sarcopterygii is the clade of lobe-finned fish, the coelacanths, lungfish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals, which we covered in the past 34 episodes of this series. But we forgot to mention an important trait. You see, vertebrates have different ways they attach their upper and lower jaws to each other and to the skull. For example, in most modern sharks, the jaws are mainly supported by the hyomandibular arch. On the other hand, in the lineage leading to the lungfish and tetrapods, the upper jaw became fused to the skull, and the lower jaw articulates directly with the upper jaw. The hyomandibular arch does not provide support. Instead, a portion of this structure now functions to transmit sound waves to the inner ear, becoming the stapes. We have previously noted how two of the inner ear bones unique to mammals, the incus and malleus, were derived from the quadrate and articular bones which originally composed the joints of the jaws. It turns out that the stapes are similarly derived from bones that originally functioned for jaws. Now we can turn our attention to the clade that represents half of all vertebrate diversity, Actinopterygii, more commonly known as the ray finned fish. The clade joining Sarcopterygii with Actinopterygii is called Osteichthys, the bony fish, and their common ancestor lived about 430 million years ago in the late Silurian. Life on land is more or less the same as it was in the last episode, with early land plants, fungi, and terrestrial arthropods happily living without any vertebrates feeding on them. To repeat the refrain, there are very few differences between these lineages once we get down near the common ancestor of lobe and ray finned fish. This can be seen with the early members of each group, such as Struneus, an early lobe finned fish, and Moithamasia, an early ray finned fish, both from the late Devonian. Apart from Struneus having two dorsal fins and a symmetrical tail, while Moithamasia has only one dorsal fin and an asymmetrical tail, they look very similar. Even the shape of the fins are not much different. Despite the fact that one clade is commonly named after their rayed fins, both bony fish lineages actually started with fins that are rather lobed. Rayed fins is a more derived character that evolved later. And, seemingly contradictory, there are still a few ray finned fish with primitive lobed fins still with us. More on that later. Back in the deep past, the main difference between the, the fins of these lineages were on the inside. The fins of lobe finned fish are connected to the body by only one bone, the humerus, while the pectoral fins of ray finned fish are connected to the body by multiple bones, called radials. We also know of a few older genera from the early Devonian and late Silurian closer still to the last common ancestor. Unsurprisingly, paleontologists have a rather difficult time differentiating these as either early lobe finned or early ray finned fish, or if they are stem groups that belong outside the bony fish crown group. For the past decade or so, Saurolepis, Giyu, and Acoania have been grouped together as the most basal sarcopterygians known. However, a 2019 analysis found that these fish are more likely to be stem osteichthians. The paper points out that depending on how one weights characters and depending on which type of phylogenetic analysis one uses, whether parsimony or Bayesian, see the Gibbons tail, these fish shift between stem sarcopterygians and stem osteichthians. The parsimony analysis produced slightly statistically better results overall, finding that these fish are more likely stem osteichthians. Of course, this degree of confusion over fossils, close to a split, should be expected under evolution. Flipping to the Actinopterygian side, we find a number of very basal fish. Mimania, when initially described in 2006, was considered to be an early lobe-finned fish. 
but a more recent analysis published in 2016 concluded that Mimania is on the stem of the ray fin side. Dialapina from the early Devonian is a member of the extinct order Paleoniscaformes, which existed from the late Silurian to Cretaceous. There has been debate over the exact phylogenetic placement of each member. They are largely considered to be paraphyletic, with some, like Dialapina, being stem Osteichthians, and some appear to be stem Actinopterygians, while others are crown Actinopterygians. The late Devonian Chirolepis, Osorioichthys, Hauquilepis, Mimipisis, and the aforementioned Moithamasia are also early diverged lineages of ray finned fish. Moving within the crown group, the four extant lineages of ray finned fish in order of phylogenetic divergence are Polypteriformes, which is two genera of Bashirs and Reedfish, Chondrostei, which is two genera of Paddlefish and two genera of Sturgeons, Holostei, which is one genus of Bowfin and two genera of Gars, and finally Teleostei, containing 4,500 plus genera of all other ray finned fish. One interesting thing to note about the three early diverging groups is that they are exclusively found in freshwater habitats. This raises an interesting question regarding what habitats these fish originate from. The principle of parsimony seems to suggest a freshwater origin for the last common ancestor of extant Actinopterygians. If this is the case, then teleosts entered marine ecosystems later. But there are also several teleos lineages which have switched back from marine to freshwater independently, and there are also those that happily live in both environments. Fish do what they want, I guess. What about the ecological origins of Osteichthians as a whole? This isn't as straightforward. Stem Osteichthians seem to have been mostly marine, but what about the split between the ray-finned and lobe-finned fish? Stem relatives to Actinopterygians include both marine and freshwater species. What about the Sarcopterygians? Early coelacanth relatives were mostly marine, but some were freshwater as well. In contrast, Porolepiformes, the sister group to the lungfish, predominantly inhabited freshwater environments. However, the earliest members of the lungfish lineage were marine, and later there were at least two independent transitions from marine to freshwater. After the Permian, the last marine lungfish became extinct. Finally, the earliest tetrapodomorphs were marine and freshwater. So, in the case for Sarcopterygians, a marine origin seems to be more supported, but it's far from clear-cut. In their paper published in Science from 2018, Salin et al. discuss this very issue in regards to all vertebrate groups. They conclude that all ancient vertebrate groups, including the Osteichthys, originated from shallow nearshore environments, such as reefs, lagoons, and intertidal zones. Freshwater environments were invaded repeatedly. Regardless, ray finned fish had relatively low diversity until the end Permian extinction, and they underwent a major radiation in the Triassic. The start of the Triassic is when the first fossils of each of the four Actinopterygian lineages appear. But most molecular dates point to an earlier divergence between the four lineages. The Bashirs and Reedfish lineage split off in the Devonian, the Paddlefish Sturgeon split off in the Carboniferous, and the last two lineages. Uh, the Gars and Bofins and Teleosti diverging in the Permian. But in the Triassic, these fish had diverse ecologies from the start, quickly evolving into planktivores, grazers, detritus feeders, small to large predators, and duraphages. When we move further into the Mesozoic, Actinopterygian taxonomic diversity passed that of chondrichthians, or cartilaginous fish, the sharks, rays, and chimeras. Chondrichthians never achieve their pre-Mesozoic levels of diversity again. Looking closer at the Polypteriformes, there are 13 species within the sole Bashir genus Polypterus, which means many fins, referring to its numerous dorsal fins, and only one species of reed fish, Erpetoichthys calibericus. All Polypteriformes are found in Africa today. They also have a peculiar feature that is not shared by any other ray finned fish. We have noted in the previous videos that coelacanths, and obviously the lungfish, have lungs just like the tetrapods. However, lungs aren't unique to them. Ray finned fish have a similar structure called the swim bladder. When Charles Darwin wrote on this, he hypothesized that lungs evolved from swim bladders. While he was correct about the evolutionary relationship, he was wrong about the order. Lungs are actually more primitive. Swim bladders came later. 
This conclusion is supported by the Polypteriformes. They have lungs. Yes, lungs, not swim bladders. Bonafide lungs used for respiration connected to the esophagus ventrally, just like those in Sarcopterygians. Swim bladders, on the other hand, often don't connect, and if they do, they connect dorsally to the esophagus. The genes that regulate lung development in Sarcopterygians perform the same job in Polypteriformes. Following the split between Polypteriformes and all other Actinopterygians, the lung became the swim bladder. The swim bladder is still highly vascularized like a lung in sturgeons, paddlefish, gars, and bowfins. We'll discuss how the swim bladder works in the next tale. As just mentioned, Polypteriformes possess the primitive trait of lungs. Additionally, their fins are also rather lobed, another primitive trait. For this reason, they are often referred to as living fossils, however, we discussed in the previous tale the problems with that term. Indeed, there were previously giant members of this group, like Boetius, which reached almost 10 feet in length. No extant members are close to that size. Moving on to the next clade, Acipensoriformes or Chondrostei, named as such because their skeleton is largely unossified like sharks and rays, this group contains the sturgeons and paddlefish. We encountered the paddlefish in the duckbill's tail, and sturgeon are armored fish found in North America and Eurasia. The eggs of sturgeon are considered a luxurious delicacy, more commonly known as caviar. They have an elongated rostrum too, though not to the same degree as paddlefish, and tough scoots adorning their back. The American paddlefish was endangered until recently thanks to efforts by wildlife and fishery departments. The last extant non-teleost clade is Holostei, the gars and bowfins, both toothy freshwater predators. Gars can be found across North and Central America and the Caribbean, while the monotypic bowfin, Amaya calva, is only found in the Mississippi River Basin. Thus, we have come to by far the most diverse clade of Actinopterygians with around 30,000 described species, Teleostei. Following the common ancestor of Holostei and Teleostei, Teleosts experienced a whole genome duplication which has likely contributed to various evolutionary innovations they have attained. A major characteristic of Teleosts is their movable premaxilla that is unattached from the cranium. By protruding the premaxilla forward, this creates lower pressure within the mouth, sucking prey in. Some teleosts have taken this to an extreme, like the slingjaw wrasse, Epibulus insidiator, that can protrude its jaws over half the length of its head. Teleosts have evolved into a huge diversity of shapes and sizes, and one of the oddest is no doubt the leafy sea dragon, Phycodurus equus, that looks like a floating piece of kelp, hence why it gets the tail. The leafy sea dragon is a member of the order Signathiformes, whose evolution we've already discussed in a video we did with Dapper Dinosaur, linked below. Signathiformes contains the well-known seahorses, which swim vertically rather than horizontally like most fish, and have prehensile tails for latching onto algae and corals. This group also contains the gorgeous mandarin dragonette, Syncaropus splendidus, the bizarre razorfish, Aeoliscus strigatus, that also swims vertically with its head down among sea urchin spines, cornetfish, which look a bit like giant pipefish, and the bicolor goatfish, Peroponeus barbarinoides, that uses its maneuverable barbels to sift through sand. Another order of oddly shaped fish is Tetrodontiformes, which contains the pufferfish, filefish, triggerfish, boxfish, and the giant ocean sunfish. Rather than being tightly streamlined, these fish are often boxy or ovular. The, in my opinion, adorable long-horned cowfish, Lactoria cornuta, has small horns jutting from its head and below its caudal fin that warn predators not to attempt eating. They also have a potent neurotoxin to deter predators. Pufferfish are known for their ability to swell in size when threatened, and many are also highly poisonous. Some species, like the porcupine puffer, Diodon holocanthus, are covered in sharp spines. Other fish have independently evolved very non-streamlined bodies, like flatfish, but we'll meet them in a future tale. Other fish have evolved to be extremely long and sinuous. Eels are probably the most well-known fish that meet this description. Some are just a few inches long, like garden eels, while others may reach up to 10 feet, like the giant moray. 
Other eels inhabit the deep sea, like the gulper eel, Uripharynx pelicanoides. The gulper eel has a stomach that typically visibly hangs below it, and when hungry, the gulper eel can open its mouth wide enough to swallow prey larger than it. Other clades of fish have independently hit on eel-like body plans. The electric eel, genus Electrophorus, is routinely confused with true eels, even though it's only distantly related to them, being a member of the South American knifefish family Gymnotiformes, whom we also discussed in the Duckbill's tale. The same goes for the so-called wolf eel, Anarichthys oscillatus, and the giant oarfish, Regalicus glesni. The teleost order Lophiaformes contains the anglerfish in their kin. Anglerfish have modified their frontmost dorsal fin spine into a lure to attract prey. Some anglerfish, like frogfish and batfish, have adapted their fins to walk around on the seafloor and coral reefs. Anglerfish have also evolved a very bizarre sexual system by which the male is very tiny in comparison to the female and latches himself onto her for the rest of his life. Wrasses, clownfish, and antheas have evolved strange sexual systems in different ways. Wrasses and antheas are all born female, but individuals may switch to males later in life. Clownfish are the exact opposite. The former is called a protogyny because the fish are females first, and the latter is protandry because they're born male. Another fish that gets a mention here is the flying fish, genus Exocetus, that has greatly enlarged pectoral fins which allow it to glide out of the water. The last group I would like to mention is the Anabantiforms, which includes Garamis and snakeheads. This is one of many groups among the Tilios that secondarily went back to freshwater from marine habitat. The family Anabantidae is also called the climbing garamis because they have been known to climb out of the water and walk short distances. There are even rumors of people seeing them climbing trees. One species, the climbing perch, has been known to live for 6 to 10 hours outside the water. Its native habitat is Southeast Asia, but in recent times it has become invasive further towards the south, likely via hitchhiking on fishing boats. The snakeheads are native to Africa and Asia, but some have been intentionally released in non-native areas either for food value or when they grow to be too large for underprepared pet owners. In the USA, snakeheads are considered to be notorious invasive species, and they are escape artists able to wiggle their way out of fish tanks. They are also able to stay alive out of water for up to four days and will travel on land from pond to pond. Members of the Anabantiforms are capable of these feats because they are able to breathe air. They don't have lungs. Lungs were lost in this lineage a long time ago. What they do have is called the labyrinth organ. It's an expanded part of the first gill arch, forming a highly vascularized chamber where air is able to enter and oxygen diffusion can take place. The males of some species, such as the Siamese fighting fish, a common pet fish, also use their labyrinth organ to build nests made of bubbles for their brood. So that's the leafy sea dragon's tail. Actinopterygians have evolved into a staggering diversity of shapes and sizes to meet their ecological needs. They have invaded niches from the equator to the poles, from fresh to salt water, from mountain streams to the abyssal depths of the oceans. Actinopterygians are evidently endlessly malleable, and in the next few tales, we're going to meet some of them in greater depth pun intended. So thanks for watching, and we'll see you all next time.